So the perennial philosophy is really the eternal wisdom, the eternal truths that underlie and are the source of all science, religions and philosophies because they all spring from that fountainhead of the one central wisdom. I'd like to welcome to the show, Dr. Eddie Billimoria. How are you doing, Dr. Eddie? I'm delighted to meet you, Alex. And whenever people ask me how I am, I say that is not an option. Good <laughs> health and a positive attitude are mandatory. It's not optional. Very true. Very true. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, your seminal work that it's, it's, okay. it's so beautifully displayed behind you, uh, Unfolding Consciousness. Uh, exploring the living universe uh, and the intelligent powers in nature and humans. Uh, a, a small, a, a small task, to say the least, is to have this conversation uh, and, and, and the books that you're writing. But my first question is, what began your journey into consciousness in general? Let me put it this way, Alex. I was trained in science. But I've always maintained an equal interest in music and art. And my love in life also, I have three loves in life, <laughs> was the perennial philosophy. And um, that combination coming together um, showed me that the main element so to speak, in the universe, and man is indeed consciousness. And the whole of life is an unfolding of consciousness on various levels and on various planes. So I wouldn't say that journey started, you know, with sudden awakening. It was a dawning awareness that scientific materialism was not providing the answers to the deepest questions of life and the perennial philosophy of all nations and all cultures without exception put the emphasis on consciousness and its expression through matter and form but science reverses it and says consciousness is the product of blind matter but let me let me ask you this because I mean, what, what well let's let's do this. What is your definition of consciousness? Because it, it it varies from person to person. It does, Alex. And the trouble with definitions is you limit things. Right. Let's put it this way: in the great sacred traditions, there are two ways of defining the divine. One is the apathetic: it is not this, it is not that. Meaning, it is not only that; it is much more than that. And the other one is the cataphetic. A thousand and one will not be enough. Two thousand definitions will not be enough. So rather than defining consciousness, I would say, how do you define love? How do you define generosity? We experience these things. But if we define, we put it into a box. Because consciousness is not an object you define and put in a box. It's an experience, and you can't put an experience in a box. Fair enough. You can see the expression of consciousness in terms of awareness, in terms of sentience, in terms of all the other qualities that we experience as human beings. For, for people who are listening, what can you can you explain what per, uh, per, um, per, uh, the philosophy you were talking about? I can't say the first name of it, the, the philosophy you were just mentioning. Well, the, the perennial. Perennial, yes, perennial. Can yeah, well, you explain what that is? Yes, it comes under various names. Um, one is esoteric science. So the other one is hermeticism. But essentially, uh, it is to do with the inner side of life and nature. Esoteric means that which is hidden in the sense of the invisible influences that are behind the outward phenomena 
the causative factors, the noumena behind the phenomena. So the perennial philosophy is really the eternal wisdom, the eternal truths that underlie and are the source of all science, religions, and philosophies, because they all spring from that fountainhead of the one central wisdom, which then flows out in these various streams that we call science, religion, philosophy, and art. So perennial is a wonderful term that was um, also used by the great Albert Schweitzer, and he right, likened perennialism to a tree that always bears the same fruit, but never the same type of fruit. So, for example, you'd have an apple tree. It will always give you apples, but never the same kind of apple. Every apple will be different, meaning, meaning that the eternal wisdom, always one in essence, has got to be modified and adapted to the age and the culture and the mentality of the age we live in now. Being a man of science and being trained in science, I imagine that going down roads that are not particularly approved of, let's say, by yeah. the scientific community like you have in your work, um, first question is, how, how did that, how did the, uh, how did your colleagues uh, accept these ideas and and why are, are so many mainstream yes. ideas and materialism so stuck in in their mm -hmm. way that they cannot see any other option and, and refuse to even have a conversation I mean we're going back to Galileo for God's sakes I mean yes. it, it, they don't open their minds why is that through the scientific and medical network we have what we call now the Galileo Commission and here is just a booklet. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Yeah. It's yeah. inviting scientists to look through the telescope in just the same way that Galileo invited his professors to look through his telescope rather than arguing on the basis of their preconceptions. Mm -hmm. Now, the tragedy, Alex, is the greatest of scientists have seen the limits and the limitations and the beauty of science mm. and have pointed to the deeper wisdom by whatever name. Well, Newton, the prime example, absolute prime example, but Einstein, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Wolfgang Pauli, mm -hmm. the Nobel laureates that ushered in quantum physics. The tragedy, Alex, is their deepest thoughts have been ignored by the mainstream. And Schrodinger explained it, there are many explanations, that in the 19th century, there was an explosion of scientific materialism and technology. And that uh, created this sort of attitude that there is nothing but materialism. So we are nothing but machines. Because we create machines, we are nothing but machines. Mm -hmm. So um, materialism is deeply entrenched. And when scientists are invited to look through the telescope, meaning look at the evidence, believe you me, they say, we don't need the evidence, it's rubbish anyway. Well, I say, what kind of scientist are you then? And there's a very important point, Alex, with evidence. Through what eyes are you looking? St. Paul, did, did he not say that um, those who look through the eyes of the flesh see flesh, those who look through the eyes of the spirit will see spirit? If you don't like St. Paul, let's go to William Blake. Only if the doors of perception are cleansed, will we see the finer picture? Mm. If the, your windscreen, if your car is all fogged up, you're not going to see very much. Fog means preconceptions. So the vast majority of scientists will ignore 
the uh, insights of the enlightened scientists, and there are many, there are many enlightened scientists now increasing in number. Rupert Sheldrake, an obvious example, mm -hmm. Brian Josephson, Nobel laureate. And well, let me ask you this then, um, because so many, when quantum physics came into, into existence, the ideas of quantum physics came into existence in the 19th century, mm -hmm. um, it really hasn't, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. it hasn't made tremendous strides over the last hundred and hundred years or so since I think it was 1918, if I'm not mistaken. I might, I might be wrong, it might be a little earlier, but within the last hundred years or so, it hasn't made tremendous amount of progress because of this kind of entrenchment yes. of the mainstream, yes. correct? Yes, you're right, Alex. And um, it hasn't made progress, the least progress it has made has been in the life sciences, in the biological sciences, which is a tragedy. Generally, talking to physicists, you will get a far more open, I don't mean gullible, just a more enlightened approach. But with rare exceptions, in the life sciences, biology is deeply entrenched in the old machine mechanistic paradigm. And the machine paradigm is not wrong. This is the whole point. It's right within context. And right. regarding context, I can give you an example, if you like, Please. of what we mean by context and levels, if you like. Please. Right. Well, briefly, every day, uh, whatever the weather in England, I like to go running around my local lake. It's not mine. <laughs> it's five minutes away. And there is a beautiful playground, and you see children having a lovely time on the swing and the slide. Now, let's imagine, just imagine, that a child comes down the slide and knocks the tooth out. Perfectly. And the slide manufacturer gets hauled in. Hey, you didn't design the slide. Now, from his point of view, a child coming down a slide is a mass coming down a slope. It's just the transformation of potential energy at the top, kinetic energy at the bottom. It can be a child, it can be a piece of wood, it can be a stone. As far as the slide design is concerned, there is a mass coming down a slope. That's good physics. That's all you need to know. The child knocks a tooth out, mummy takes him to the dentist. Now, the dentist is going to regard the tooth, or the lack of it, as an object. The dentist isn't going to say, well, what's your soul nature and what's your spirit? The slide manufacturer is interested in the weight of the child, say three stone coming down. The dentist is not interested in the weight of the child. It's an object. Now, supposing the child <laughs> has a terrible uh, trauma and needs to see a psychiatrist, Will the psychiatrist say, what's your weight? Are you an object? No. The psychiatrist is going to be interested in your soul nature. What's your internal subjective nature? So these are different levels. So to ask the question at one level, at the physics level, and try to solve it at the soul level is to talk nonsense. So this is why a source of great confusion that we don't use our mental models in context. The physics model is great for physics. But a dentist can regard your teeth as an object. It doesn't make you an object. Right. I completely, that, makes, that makes all the sense of the world. So then the, the knowledge that has been around humanity for the last, let's say, 6,000 years, whether mm. that be Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine mm. that's far older. And uh, much, old, yeah, yeah. much Absolutely. older than Western medicine. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and when the West or mainstream medicine or mainstream science ignores it, dismisses it, I know. is that, yes. that, that sounds to me of being pure ego. Because don't it get is. me wrong. Don't get me mm. wrong. Look, if no. I get, like I always tell people, if I get shot, do not rub a leaf on me. <laughs> take me, take me to a hospital and, and and let them do what they do to save my life. Because at that level, 
they're they're far beyond Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine. But for the long term, these other other systems that have been around for centuries that deal in energy, that deal in uh, other chi energy and other ideas of energy that we don't understand or yet accept. So is that ego? That is that. That's the- yes. It is partly ego, it is partly institutionalized ego. But let me first say that um, in general, physical science used wisely will be will result in the physical release of man. Use unwisely, it will result in his downfall. Now, I rarely talk about my personal health because there's not much to talk about. But these eyes looking at you, believe you me, were saved when I was 15 years old. Not by acupuncture, not by homeopathy. By top ophthalmic uh, consultant. And the, the remedy was contact lenses in those days. And in those days, uh, God forbid you have a corneal operation because they would use Gillette blades. <laughs> Good Lord. In the 1960s, now they can operate with lasers. But then uh, wearing contact lenses for 20 years at the age of 15 onwards, the blood vessels creep into your cornea because of the starvation of oxygen. Material science then came in and they made gas permeable lenses. So I would go down on my knees to Western medicine. Absolutely. But there are other things where they will block research and understanding into other healing modalities. And they do not understand that allopathic medicine is essentially reductionist, whereas the homeopathic uh, and acupuncture are energetic mechanisms. So they're looking at the energy systems of the body. So Again, talking of context, Mm -hmm. if you fall down and break your leg, my goodness, uh, good luck going to homeopath. But for chronic diseases, I know personally people who've had um, long-term lung problems and have gone to a homeopath and other people who've uh, had uh, similar allergy issues and gone to an acupuncturist rather than putting cortisone cream on your skin. So, in general, it would be very good for the energetic practitioners, the homeopaths and the cats, to learn something about human physiology and structure so that they don't get carried away with their success and they don't attribute their success and de- develop their own ego equally it would be very good for the Western doctor to learn something about the energy systems so that their arrogance could be somewhat taken down a bit. So you have, on the one hand, arrogance, and you have, on the one hand, the other hand, gullibility. Arrogance is stripped away by the devotional approach The excessive devotional approach is straightened by the intellectual approach, context and balance. It's it would be nice if they looked at the energy body, but they they, if they have to first admit that it's there Mm. before they study it and accept it, which is again, it, it always fascinates me that you know I've had multiple quantum physicists and scientists on the show that especially that deal within the ideas of science and spirituality Mm -hmm. and the ideas that have been laid out in the vedic texts and other ancient uh wisdom that has survived all these years Mm -hmm. um quantum physics is starting to be able to explain or understand or even speak about like the concept of maya the comp you know of the dream of the illusion what is your what what is your feeling on on that on like simulation theory and that whole idea. I feel quantum physics is really the crown jewel of science. And Bernard Carr, who has uh, very kindly uh, endorsed my work, uh, Stephen Hawking's um, 
pupil, if I may say, his PhD, so, uh, Stephen Hawking was his PhD supervisor. Uh, Bernard Carr has a wonderful Euroboros diagram showing how physics has explored everything from the largest dimension, relativity theory, <coughs> excuse me, to the very smallest, quantum theory. But what is missing is mind. Mind is out of the equation. It doesn't mean physicists are mindless. They haven't put the central emphasis on minds. Quantum physics has brought the whole question of consciousness into the discourse. Eugene Wigner, the um, Cambridge um, Nobel laureate, said it is not possible, I'm paraphrasing, to talk about the uh, phenomena of consciousness without invoking the central role of consciousness. It does not mean that quantum physics explains consciousness. This, this is a misunderstanding. It doesn't. Consciousness is needed for many of the interpretations and to make sense of the um, experiments in quantum physics, like the famous two-hole experiment. Right. So um, quantum physics, the other tremendous contribution it has made, which has not really infiltrated the scientific mind, is shown non vocality and entanglement, and it is shown the central role of participation. John Wheeler at Princeton said, we can no longer look at phenomena in a detached way behind a glass partition, because we are part of the phenomena we are trying to understand. And I said earlier that it is a tragedy that scientists have not listened to their great fellow scientists. Max Planck himself said, the great founder, that it is not possible to understand the full uh, uh, nature in entirety. And because we are part of nature, we have got to include ourselves in that understanding. So real understanding is a participation, not a detachment. It's like trying to do a science experiment on something that you are a part of. Yeah. And having a clear understanding of yeah. that. Yeah. That's absolutely, absolutely fascinating. So, very simplistically, if I want to understand my neighbor uh, in the materialistic sense, I drag him in, put him on my kitchen table, cut him up, weigh his bits and pieces. Come on. But how do I only found out his material part stuff? Yeah. To know him, I've got to bring him in, have tea with him, and have a conversation with him. So how do you measure that, which is consciousness? Because you're absolutely that's a great example, by the way, because materialism looks at the body at, mm -hmm. to find out who your neighbor is. And they can cut it, they can weigh it, they can look at it, they can analyze it, put it under a microscope, they can do everything they can to the material body. But what has constantly evaded science mm -hmm. is what's running the body, what is running the mind, the concept of emotions, the concept of consciousness is mm -hmm. something that is unquantifiable. Yeah. And they just ignore it. They're just like, well, that doesn't, we just, we're just going to focus on the body. But there's something unquantifiable about consciousness. Would you agree with that? Unquantifiable in the quantitative sense. Correct. Quantify love, quantify right. selfishness. You know? But you've hit on a very important point there, Alex. The body, science looks to the form, to the change in form. And evolution in the... Darwinian biological sense looks only to the change in form. But what's driving that change of form? There is an inner principle that is driving that change in form. Why does, take the human eye, I used the example of the eye. Why is it that the cornea doesn't have a blood supply, whereas all the other organs have blood supply? Now, why? Because if you had blood cells, a light wouldn't go through. So where does the cornea get its um, oxygen from? From the air and from your tears. The cells at the back of the cornea have a pumping action to keep out moisture. Because if moisture ingresses, you know, your car windscreen's fogging up. 
Who designed that? <laughs> the 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 eye. I think Goethe, correct me if I'm or Blake, if the eye was not of the essence of light, it could not see light. And this is a, an important point. Um, science has found that a woodpecker can peck 20 times a second without concussing its brain because of soft tissue. Yes. But which scientist designed the woodpecker? Scientists know that the giraffe has a, a long neck and therefore the uh, um, the head has got to be light. It needs a strong heart to pump the, uh, the stuff up. It needs valving in the throat. So when he puts his head down, it doesn't go. Oh. But this has all come together as an orchestration. No veterinary scientist has designed a giraffe. So it's a very important point and so Arthur Thompson, FRS, pointed out, science does not explain. It discovers and it observes. The discoveries are marvelous, but it does not explain. The cheetah runs at 70 miles an hour thanks to its muscles and the tail acts as a rudder. No scientist designed a cheetah, and we can go on like that. Sure. So there is an inner principle behind the form. Well, let me ask you this, because this is an example I use a lot of times when I'm speaking about quantum physics and, and mm -hmm. spirituality, yeah. is that, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, sure. We've, yeah, been, no. able, we've been able now to go down into the quantum level past the molecule past mm -hmm. the atom, going past the neutrons. And if you just keep going down and down and down, at a certain point, there is just space yes. between the two par between particles. A am I correct in the explanation? There is vibrant space. Right. So that vibrant so now materialism by that idea alone has been in many ways debunked because what is solid yeah. is not solid. Alex, Sir Karl Popper all those years ago, it's another example of science ignoring the great people. What did he say? He used the word promissory materialism in his great book with Sir John Eccles, a Nobel laureate, Sir Karl Popper. He said that the very discoveries of science has demolished the notion of materialism. Materialism, he said, has transcended itself. So that space you talk about is a mental field. It, it is, so to speak, um, a field of mind, which is why mathematics is such a beautiful subject in explaining the physical world. How can an abstract subject completely of the mind, mathematics, explain a physical phenomena if that physical phenomena were not intrinsically of the nature of mind, M-I-N-D. Mm. So you're absolutely right. Um, Heisenberg also said, if we go chopping down quarks, sub-quarks, sub-sub-quarks, we reach a stage where division has no meaning. Right. And yet, at CERN, they're now proposing to build another large hadron collider and i've mentioned that in the in the book costing 20 billion 20 billion now it'll be double that when they build it mm -hmm. to bash more and more particles to find out the ultimate particle so one of the reasons for this is the explosion of technology right. and because we have machines and technology we worship material science, which I always say has its place. Right, and that started back in the Industrial Revolution, when yes, we, when we started building these amazing technological feats—the mm -hmm. airplane, the car, mm -hmm. factories, everything—that mm -hmm. and we and did it in such a short, uh, in, within the history, very short amount of time. In very the last short amount 120 of time. years has been yes. Yes. immense. It's been an 
it has been an explosion. But so my question to you is going all the way down and dividing, subdividing, and keep going and keep going when there is that vibrational energy space, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. what is holding it together then? Is it consciousness? If this table that I'm on right now, mm -hmm. I'm resting on, has space in between it, what makes it solid? What is holding these particles together? What is holding me together? What is holding this microphone together? What is the thing that creates this material thing that we touch? Is it the mind? Is it consciousness? What is it? Let's call it a field. Okay. In the same way that a field will organize iron filings. Right. To use a bar magnet. It, it, call it the field of mind, mm -hmm. the field of consciousness. But that's a, that's a deep question. It, it is. It is. That's yeah. what we try to do on the show. I, I try to go. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, the deeper, the better. <laughs> exactly. So then... Yeah. So then the idea of, well, I just found, I just, I just uh, learned about the, the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, I stay as close to the scientific community as I can, but I'm not up on it all the time. And I just discovered what they wanted for uh, mm -hmm. in quantum physics, which was that the universe isn't real. Mm. Using quantum entanglement to explain it was three physicists. Mm. Uh, that is mind blowing ideas how did that how is the scientific community even grasping these concepts of of what they're talking about which has been proven now by math and quantum physics yes so if it's not real what are they on about right right uh, let me answer it in two parts firstly okay. when heisenberg was dying his last words to his pupil von Weisacker were it is very easy i never knew this before physics is of no importance the universe is not real so <laughs> but he only got a nobel prize for physics it doesn't mean it's not real it exists but it is not the ultimate essence of reality. Exist means exist to stand up. Let's look at reality in this way now, part two of my answer. How many dimensions can one see? If one were a bug um, crawling on, on a flat surface, mm -hmm. only able to see one dimension, you know, one would not see... Um, the the breath if one had um, a two-dimensional vision one sees length and breadth but one would fall off the edge so to speak mm -hmm. if one could see three dimensions you know but taking this further th there's some people who only see the literal they open the book and they only see the literal another dimension is to see the meaning behind the words now it doesn't mean that the third dimension was hidden. It's only that the bug didn't see it. So these higher dimensions are subsumed, they're hidden. So the more dimensions one can access, the more reality becomes real. So string theory and M theory, the talk of 13 dimensions and other dimensions, are exploring these other dimensions. So the universe is not real in the sense that what they're seeing is an aspect of the whole and not the whole thing, which is another way of looking at Maya. Maya does not mean just illusion. It means appearance. Things are not what they appear to be. Ah, good Lord. Well, let me ask you this then. Uh, because I've I've studied um, uh, Hindu traditions and yogic mm -hmm. yogic philosophies and things like that. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, you know, when you get to a certain level of evolution as a yogi, mm -hmm. uh, like Yogananda or you know oh, Baba, yeah. a Baba Ji yeah. or uh, Lahir Mahashaya, any of these 
any of these yoga or Buddha um, in, in different. Babaji. Uh, Babaji. <laughs> yeah. Babaji's. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, uh, Yukteswar. 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 Yeah, Yukteswar. I have him, yes. well, I have him in the painting in the back. Yeah, uh, His name mentioned. Yes. Yes, of course. Um, so these, these masters, mm -hmm. when they evolve to a certain level, are they in a spiritual sense becoming more aware of, are they seeing things that we are not seeing, which seems to us magical, which is, has been spoken about in these spiritual texts so much, are they just able to see things from a different perspective, like that fly example? They're, they're now, they're, their view is widened a bit to the point where it's almost difficult to explain what they're able to see without being there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that does make sense. The, the crude analogy would be, I'm in this room to explore my house. I need to go from room to room to room. If the walls were made of glass, say, yeah. and I went up in a helicopter and the roof were transparent, I could see the house as a whole. Um, let's be a bit more specific. Both have their uses. If I want to understand the, the lie of a city and its relationship to the mountains and the scenery, I go up in a helicopter. But if I want to see where you live, your street, that's not going to help. I need to come down and go and explore this at street level. So these masters can indeed see the universal and they operate from the standpoint of the universal, which is why, why their vision, their spiritual vision is so much wider. A parent, for example, has a, a much wider awareness of, of uh, where the child is and what it's doing than before it became a parent. Mm -hmm. As a, another simplistic example, v so very, masters very indeed have this universal vision, which they can access when needed. Being a parent, I understand completely what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I completely understand. Talking now, you are aware what's going on if a child were being naughty some way or the other. Well, you know what's fascinating? I find that before my children, I didn't see this, but after my children, mm -hmm. I'm able to see the potential or the probability of something going mm -hmm. wrong mm -hmm. by the actions that they're beginning to do. And it's not right. apparent all the time. But like I and it's weird because I'll walk by and I and I'll look, I go, that glass is gonna fall. That glass <laughs> is gonna be that glass is gonna break. <laughs> you know it, and you know this is going to lead to tears. Oh yeah, it is exactly <laughs> and it is gonna yeah. and but it's it's almost a sixth sense that parents have. And yes. I see it all the time, and I stop yeah. them from a lot a lot of times I stop them from doing it. I'm starting to let them do it so they learn. Because I yes, keep yeah, stopping them yeah. because I keep seeing what they're about to do. But that is, it's very interesting in our conversation because that is an awareness that did not exist prior to having children. And I think parents listening will agree with us that, that mm -hmm. there is a different perspective. So on a spiritual standpoint, these masters mm -hmm. have been able to heighten their awareness and those I those that vision, if you will, has been open mm -hmm. to them by their yeah. own meditative practices, by mm -hmm. their own abilities, going inward sure. and so on. Yes. And it yes. explains a little bit about what this, these kind of magical quote unquote stories of things that yogis could do, or even Jesus did, or Buddha mm -hmm. did. These ideas start to make a little bit more sense. Is that a fair statement? It does make a lot of uh, uh, com complete sense because what we call magic is our misunderstanding or our lack of understanding of the higher laws and the higher principles, which they, as a result of their evolution and their status, have managed to access and use very wisely and very sparingly. Right. That's very true. Yeah. Generally, yogis aren't walking around going, look what I can do. No way. <laughs> no. Ignore anyone who says that. Right. There if anyone's like, look, false idols and false gurus. Yeah. There was one. There was one story I saw that there was a a yogi that came and and, saw, and spoke to another yogi. He's like, look what I can do, and he levitated across the the river to the other side, mm -hmm. and he just wanted to show off to this one yogi because he had focused his entire life on 
that power, the, that yogic mm. power. Mm. And then mm. the other yogi is like, what do you think? He goes, I use the bridge. <laughs> like I just walked across the bridge. Why yeah. did you waste a, decades on doing that when you could have easily just walked the bridge? Why wouldn't you spend that time even evolving beyond this ego? Well said. There is a, a um, an injunction in the yogi philosophy and in the occult sciences, if I may use the word occult in the true sense mm -hmm. of the invisible laws, use the minimum amount of energy for a certain result. Don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut, in other words. Right. Very true. So only use high octane energy when you need it. Very, How very stupid true. to levitate across the bridge when you could swim across it or use the bridge. Right. It's it's a uh, across the river, I meant. Yeah. It's okay. a nice it's a nice parlor yeah. trick. Yeah. But the amount of energy it took to learn that that yogic power could have easily been focused on higher evolution. Yes, and not only that, it would run counter to your further evolution and progress. Correct. It would definitely run counter. There would be an inner deterioration for misusing a higher power as a party trick. Now, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on the, the work that's being done now in psychedelics and consciousness. What is yes. your What is your experience with psychedelics and, and consciousness, because it's another field of consciousness that is unquantifiable and cannot be explained by the materialism of, of science and physics, because it's just beyond what they're doing. They're trying to figure it out, but it's almost like yeah. a child trying to solve, you know, a, a, a trigonometry. It, it, it's so far beyond them. <laughs> yes. I've written a, a heavy piece on psychedelics in the book and I'm completely against it now let me say I'm in no way am I knocking the use of psychedelics for serious psychiatric problems yes or no I mean I really mean that for serious depression but to use psychedelics as a let's have a glass of whiskey let's take a bit of correct it's a, it's irresponsible yeah. it's and it has serious side effects for a start um, if i want to let me give you this example if i'm raising my consciousness using psychedelics i am bursting so to speak into a region that i'm not qualified to enter so for example i love playing the piano i've played the piano all my life and i have a beautiful steinway I would love to give a concert in Carnegie Hall or Royal Festival Hall. There are two ways I can do it. One is to qualify, practice 10 hours a day to win a competition and be invited. The other stupid way is to burst into the hall, you know, blow the pianist off and, you know, play the piano. Mm -hmm. A stupid example, but... Am I qualified to do that? No. If I climb the Himalayas, I wish to climb it. I don't want to go on a helicopter on top and say I've climbed the Himalayas. But there's a more serious point. Psychedelics disorder the inner nature. Rudolf Steiner, Lovatsky, and all have warned against the disorganization of the etheric body, the linga sharira, the the model body, the energy field. What psychedelics also do is cause a disorganization in the pituitary and the pineal. So to resort to psychedelics is ultimately to ask for one's inner deterioration. There is only one way, the way of truth, purity, philanthropy, meditation, study, 
all of that. The hard way. So they're cheating. It, it's not a, it, they're cheating. It's not a hard way. It's a joyful way. No, you because know what I mean? It's, really it's the long path. It's the long path yeah, versus yeah, the long yeah. short, short path. That's right. Yeah. You're not bursting into the bank. You're, you're, you've earned it. And that's and, th- and that's so interesting because you know I've studied Ram Dass as well and Ram oh, right. Dass yes I know he did yes, yes and he yes. specifically said he's like I kept taking trips but mm-hmm. I couldn't stay yeah. and it was it was just fleeting it would go in and out in and out yeah. till finally he met the Maharashi and he's like I met a a, a person who was there mm-hmm. all the time naturally yeah. and he's like I want to learn that and that was a big lesson for him yeah one of the founding fathers of of, right. uh, of psychedelics yeah. in the 60s sure. but if you take a psychedelic have a trip experience and then it spurs you then to walking the path that that's fine it's an experience right but it's not a substitute it it can't be a substitute you can't, can't cheat it, yeah but it is a doorway in and for, yeah. i've had i've had um i've had uh uh, vet- veterans, uh, war veterans who who are now taking in clinical s- settings oh, psychedelics yeah. to well, take care of their PTSD. He told me on the show, he was like, I, I've, well, I, I for heaven's took- sake, Alex, a war veteran, if you think of the trauma. Right. My goodness, then I would say it's not a psychedelic, it's medicine for them. It, correct. It's medicine. And yeah. nice to hear it. Yeah, there, so it does have its place, but it is a powerful tool like yeah. anything else. And you will not find enlightenment through a psychedelic. <laughs> no. Or if you do, you will pay a heavy price if you keep using it. Right, exactly. Because, you, it, again, it's something that you just can't stay yeah. there. And, and the heavy price very often is psychic attacks. Because right. you opened a, a, a gateway, you rented the protective veil of the etheric body and um, you know you hear people going on a bad trip or a good trip and you've opened yourself up to entities that would not normally uh, hook into you right it's like trying to be a professional uh, American football player Mm. and you are playing in high school and somehow you snuck your way into an NFL game you're going to get run over pretty bad and kicked Hard and kicked hard and beat up yeah, pretty hard, yeah. uh, yeah. because you're just not ready for that. So yeah. someone like a Yogananda, mm. who was able to go there whenever he wanted to, yes. because of years of training and and mm. uh, you know just going down this long mm-hmm. spiritual path, mm-hmm. can just go there instantly because he was strong enough to play the game, if you will. Yes, well put. Play yes, very well put. I couldn't have put it better. Play the game. According to the rules. Right. There and are there are rules. Like you say, you can sneak onto the field yeah. and there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Yeah. But beware. <laughs> because or you can burst into a concert hall and, and play the piano. Because security be will take you out. Security yeah. will take you out eventually. And the audience will boo you. And the <laughs> audience is gonna boo you, so it's not what you yeah. want. But mm-hmm. there is there is place for depression and other traumatic. That's entirely evidence. different. Entirely yeah. different. Yeah, yeah ex- exactly. Um, so it's it's just a powerful thing. But I am glad that there is a lot more research happening now. It's not been demonized like it was. No, that that's good. Uh, at Imperial College, for example, uh, where I went. Uh huh. Exactly. 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 Now. Uh, you, you held up the book uh, by Yukteswa, uh, The Holy Science, yeah. uh, which is a, one of my favorites. In that mm. book, he talks about the yugas, the the cycle of yes, of, yes. En- of enlightenment, if you will, of this of mm. the species of of us. Do mm. you believe that we were we are now rediscovering knowledge that has been lost in in centuries past? Yes, we are, so to speak cycling backwards in order to go forwards uh, that sounds paradoxical right but we are rediscovering knowledge which was lost because in the midst of antiquity the human body was entirely different we were much more open the psychic faculties were much more um augmented should we say but having acquired our coats of flesh that has been <clears throat> shut down a bit so to speak, 
and we are rediscovering this ancient wisdom, this ancient knowledge on a higher turn of the spiral. So what we knew semi-unconsciously, unconsciously, we are now rediscovering in full awareness and consciousness. And 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 hopefully going to a place that we haven't been before, beyond where mm. we've been before. Beyond um, and above. Right, yeah. exactly. Because, I mean, and not to get into the pyramids and, you know, all the things mm. that they're discovering around the world, just yeah. going, this doesn't make sense. It, it, the, the concepts, the things that they've been telling us over the years, as mm. far as science, archaeology, the, the, mm. you know, we life started 5,000 years ago. I'm like, yeah, well... How is it that they built the pyramids? But really, five thousand? <laughs> right, like exactly, like really five thousand. If that's the case, then how come we can't? If we tried to rebuild the pyramids today, it'd be mammoth. You would never get a twenty-five ton granite capstone on the top with all the slaves and all the ca- scaffolding in the world, and <laughs> all the heavy lift craning. Even even if we wanted to try to do in the preciseness of it and yeah. the and the, sh- the hidden math yes. in it, yes, and people have found it so precise that you could all you could not even slip, slip a piece, piece of paper. So this was a, a technique, of etheric energy, for want of a better word, that they had access to using sound. I heard that, yeah, using sound. And there is a place in India that I visited called Shivapur, mm-hmm. where I witnessed, and I was very young then, um, levitating stones. And we're talking of how much does a stone of about that size weigh, I don't know, so 50 pounds, by putting your finger, uh, just uh, touching it with your finger, and you needed seven people or 11 people. But the mantra was Kamali Davesh who was the name of the local Sufi saint. And obviously, uh, this wisdom had been passed down. Unfortunately, I didn't have a movie camera. That would would have been amazing to do. And and a lot of this knowledge that we're talking about has been Mm -hmm. passed down from centuries of of, yes. of knowledge. Yes, you're right, Alex. Mm. And, and science has just ignored it. And it's just so... I feel that it's opening up. And I think it started with the... the uh, Not the invention, but the remembering of quantum physics. And, and when mm. these ideas started to come in, it started to start to crack this materialism. It is. It, it is. It's a, in, in, from your understanding, scientists mm-hmm. are becoming a little bit more open-minded. Again, not in mass. But there are more now than there were 20 yes, years there ago. Are. And scientists, what they say at university is entirely different from what they say at home to their families in private. They have to maintain that mask of respectability. But it is also important that some of this, a lot of this knowledge is not released because it would absolutely play havoc. I mean, look with what we're doing with nuclear power, for goodness sake. So mm-hmm. if we had access to higher energy forms, given our the mass state of human morality and ethics, we just annihilate ourselves. So, so is there's that... a lovely saying in the secret doctrine that the occult sciences, the invisible laws of nature and science, Occult science only drops its pearls far and wide apart, and only when the pressure of evolution demands that this be necessary, because you've got pearls in front of swine, rather than pearls to be used in the most beautiful sense. Is that why... If you, for lack of a better word, the quantum mm-hmm. field or whatever you want to call it, the universe, the mm-hmm. the, the other side, whatever you want to call right. it, that information, when it's ready to be released, comes through at the moment that it needs to come through and not before. Absolutely. Alex, no one could have put it better. Yes. One sees many examples, um, typically in mathematics, Newton and Leibniz when they formulated the calculus 
um, in music, one sees a particular art form coming through different minds. So prepared minds will access the universal cloud of knowing. So when a certain knowledge is needed, that's when it is put through. And if I may say this was the central thrust of the Theosophical Society. Yeah. And if I can just say that one of the, the great sayings, we're talking of the middle of the 19th century, that between degrading religious superstition, superstition, and even more degrading scientific brutal materialism, the white dove of truth knows not where to put her weary foot. So one of the reasons for uh, this outpouring of uh, wisdom through the Theosophical Society was not was not to divulge occult secrets, but to inculcate a brotherhood of humanity, which could only be done by showing these higher laws of nature and showing that man and the universe are not just put together by blind chance. So there was that outpouring of wisdom then, because science was charging ahead, but it completely ignored the spiritual side and it need to be countered with the esoteric and the occult wisdom. So you're absolutely right. Things come through when they're needed. In yeah, prepared you, minds, through prepared minds. Right. It would be the equivalent, and I've said this on the show before, the the idea of me going back to the 1800s and going, mm. here's the internet. Explain the internet. Explain Wi-Fi. Explain a cell yeah. phone. Explain a car well, or an you airplane. You the vocabulary then. Well, I would. They wouldn't. You know, in the 18th century. <laughs> they wouldn't even understand. They weren't prepared for that yeah. information. One good example of that, when you said uh, people are beginning to, science are beginning to open up, you have interviewed Irvin Laszlo. Yes, I love Irvin. The car show, and yes. the idea of Akasha is now in his book. Right. He says it is the womb from which everything we perceive with our senses has emerged and into which everything will ultimately redescend. The Akashic record is the enduring record of all that happens and has ever happened in the whole universe. Now, that comes from a scientist. A Nobel nominee. Two-time nominee. Two yeah. time nominee. The president of the, uh, of the Budapest Club. Yeah. So it is slowly trickling. It, it, it's fascinating because before something like the Akashic Records, which I've talked about, and I, in my research, discovered that the Akashic Records were talked about in the Vedas. I had no of idea. Course. I had no idea because I was just... Yes. Yeah. In the research of it, because I thought it was a new age, like, hey, man, it's the Akashic Records. And when I yeah. found out that it was in the Vedic text four, five, six thousand or older years oh, ago. More. And more. Newton referred to it as Ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, not E-T-H-E-R, Ether. So this concept of the Akashic Records is now coming in, which then Ooh. quantum physics is starting to try to explain oh. this sure. idea which is so far beyond our capability mm. of even understanding. It is the equivalent of me going back to the 1700s and mm. saying, this is an iPhone. It's mm. that far removed, but our minds are a little bit a little bit more open to understanding yes. the concept now, but still mm. not widely accepted. But maybe in yeah. 50 years, maybe in 100 years, these ideas mm. will come up. Um, mm. uh, Dr. Eddie, tell me about your books, because I mean, you it took you uh, it, it, you wrote these books in about a week, right? A week or two. It didn't take you long to write these books at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> for for each week, uh, for each day of the week, substitute about ten years. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, this well. is a massive, ca massive uh, library, if you will, four volumes of unfolding consciousness. Very difficult concepts to talk about. How long? Tell me about the books. How long did it take you to write it, and why you decided to write it? Well, if I say to someone, "Why do you love this lady or gentleman?" and you come up with lots of reasons, you don't really love her. You have an investment. I love her because of her money or her looks or whatever. So, my driving force was really, really a love of the subject. But then one has to be practical. 
you know. A composer writes a symphony because he loves it, but he has to use the instruments and uh, he has a timeline. My driving motive was, again, this whole question of scientific materialism, which is so triumphant in its field, but it's so impoverished and so constipated in what it cannot deal with. As Schrodinger, Nobel laureate, and a great student of the uh, Vedanta, said, we do not live in this world that science constructs for us. And he said in his uh, lectures at University College, I'm, I'm very astonished that how deficient the scientific picture is. Science can explain how the waves of rarefaction and sound waves impinge on our ears and we have a process in the brain, but why? Why does an old song reduce us to tears? Experience, it cannot explain. And then he says, but science tries to explain these things, but the, the answers are so silly that we're not inclined to take them seriously. That's Schrodinger. So there are reasons. So part of my driving uh, motive was to try and redress this balance. My first book, the snake and the rope was to show how occult science, the perennial philosophy, resolves conundrums in science. And this this uh, set of four volumes is, in a sense, uh, ongoing. Interestingly, looking back, my ideas were implicit, but the more I was writing, the more they became explicit. Implicit means rolled in. Explicit means turned out. So I had this implicit love and desire to write, but the more I was writing, the more my reasons clarified. Amazing. Well, um, I'm going to ask. I would like to suggest that it's not so difficult to read because I have a summary of each chapter mm -hmm. at the beginning, I have a synopsis at the beginning of each chapter, and a lead from each chapter to the next. And an uh, index of uh, nearly 90 pages. Good Lord. <laughs> God bless my friend. I... <laughs> and, and five languages in the glossary. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, well, listen, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Mm -hmm. um, what is your definition of living a good life? My definition of or my experience of living a good life is living a life where I'm fulfilling my potentiality. And I can never fulfill my potentiality just by living for myself. So it means the flowering, think of a bud that flowers into petals. So there is that bud, me, the petals I wish to flower are music, science and what I'm writing about and a flower should emit a fragrant perfume not because the flower is so vain because it's its natural nature so a good life for me has nothing to do with material possessions other than what one basically needs and I made the point in a couple of chapters of the difference between inner poverty and out of poverty. If you think of poor Jeffrey Epstein and his unfortunate accomplice, he was not short of a few millions. He was not short of complete indulgence. <laughs> Where did it get him? So a good life is always to grow the inner riches. And the older one gets, the more one should grow inwardly. When one's young, one grows outwardly. If you don't grow, if you're two inches at the age of 10, something's wrong. Right. So there is the outer growth, and then there is the inner growth. So a good life is to grow inwardly, ever more, ever more. Because the soul of man, and by man I mean mankind, or each person, is limitless. And the only limitations are what we put on ourselves.
Well said, my friend. Well said. What is your definition of God? (laughs) (laughs) I don't define. Well, I said earlier about the apathetic and the cataphetic. God is not this, not that, not that. And then in the Parsi Zoroastrian, which is my the religion I was born into, uh, we have a saying, the 101 names of God. Uh, Islam has the 99 names. 99 does not mean 100 minus 1. 101 doesn't mean 100 plus 1. It means infinite. So my understanding is it is the universal field of intelligence, of consciousness, conscious matter, if you like, conscious substance, which informs all of the universe. And Schiller, the great Schiller, who Beethoven, of course, uh, immortalized, said the, the universe is a thought of deity. And since and, uh, and because this thought has overflowed into actuality, the universe thereof has realized the plan of its creator. Creator doesn't mean a chap with a white beard, you know, the divine consciousness. So it is our task of every intelligent being to try and understand the original purpose. And what is the ultimate purpose of life? To live. <laughs> fair enough, my friend. Fair enough. And where to can people uh-huh. in in harmony with the world mind? I have to ask, what is the world mind? The world mind. I mean, it, it is the the field of consciousness that informs our present existence, depending on the yuga and depending on the age you live in. And where can people find out more about you and the amazing work that you're doing? Oh, gosh. (laughs) I'm not used to (laughs) self-advertising. I I do have a website. Another way of finding out is please speak to Alex. He's a wonderful person. (laughs) <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed talking to him. The other person is Anne Kelly, who's doing a wonderful um, job for me mm-hmm. in uh, as my PA assistant. Mm-hmm. I would always say the messenger does not come first. I'm the postman, the message. It is most important. Agreed. That's what I try to do here in the show. That's what I, yeah. I constantly am trying yeah, I, to do. I can, I can sense that. But you can't have the message without... <laughs> a messenger. A uh, yeah, messenger, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you have any final uh, words for our audience? Yes, there is a way. And it is that the, the principle that gives life dwells in us and is around us. It cannot be seen or touched or smelt, but it can be discerned by anyone who desires wisdom. Dr. Eddie, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been such a pleasure and honor speaking to you. And thank you for the the amazing work you're doing. uh, My honor as well. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey and don't forget to subscribe.